Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the California High Speed Rail Authority Board of Directors meeting for April. Thank you for joining us. Uh, first, uh, we'll, we will call the meeting to order and please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Schenck. I believe you're muted. You're right, I was muted. I am present. <laughs> Chair Richards. Here. Director Camacho. Present. Vice Chair Miller. Here. Assembly Member Rambula. Present. <laughs> Director Prea. Here. Director Gilometti. Present. Director Scutia. Here. Director Butros. Here. Director Williams. Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And uh, if uh, you'll bring the, the flag up, we'll uh, have the Pledge of Allegiance. Please repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, States of America. and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. And welcome, colleagues. Uh, the first order of business before we start our agenda today will be public comment. And I'm gonna ask the secretary to please provide the instructions to the public, and then we'll move right into public comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning and welcome to the California High Speed Rail Board of Directors public meeting. Today, we are hosting this meeting via Zoom. In a moment, we will take public comment. First, we wanna run through some important technical aspects of this meeting for offering public comment. If you are logged into this meeting via Zoom, please use the raise your hand feature typically located at the bottom of your screen so that I may call on you to provide your comment. If you're dialing in by phone, pressing pound two will raise your hand and put you into our queue. Speakers will be called in the order that their hand is raised. Once you've been in the queue and your name is called, in the web meeting, please click the prompt on your screen to allow your microphone to be unmuted. On the phone, we will call on you by the last four digits of your phone number. At that point, you'll hear a message that you are being unmuted. Once unmuted, it will be your turn to speak. Please slowly and clearly say and spell your first and last name, and if applicable, state the organization you represent. After your introduction, each speaker is allotted two minutes to provide comments. Our court reporter is on the line to record those comments. If they need you to spell or repeat something, they may interject. I will notify you when your time is nearly up. At the end of your comment, we will disable your microphone. However, you are welcome to stay on the line to continue watching or listening to the meeting. If you do not wish to provide comment and simply want to watch the meeting, you can do so by logging on to hsr.ca.gov and looking for the link to our live stream. Mr. Chairman, first up for public comment, we have a Brian Yanity. Good morning, Mr. Nietti. Good morning, Chair Richards and members of the board. Uh, can you hear me? We hear you uh, loud and clear. Welcome. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to provide comments today. My name is Brian Yanity, and I am Vice President South of the Rail Passengers Association of California and, and Nevada, also known as RailPAC. And RailPAC is a strong supporter of the High Speed Rail Project. Um, we are an all-volunteer organization that was founded in 1978, and I mentioned at the last uh, board meeting, we've been a supporter of high-speed rail in California since 1978. Um, our, many of our members have volunteered their time to contact their elected representatives in support of it, and we will continue to, um, and we're doing this all on a volunteer basis because we think this is an amazing project in the best interest of the state as a whole. Um, but I do want to raise concern that I mentioned before about uh, the Colton Intermodal Yard um, proposed by BNSF in the Inland Empire. 
And uh, the High Speed Rail Authority is evalu evaluating that with BNSF as part of the uh, LA Anaheim project section. So it kind of seems to us that, um, you know, BNSF is in effect getting public subsidy for development of that rail yard, correct me if I'm wrong, um, part of the EIR process at least. And uh, there's a lot of opposition building to that rail yard in the Inland Empire for the same reason that there's a lot of concern about diesel pollution, you know, everything from childhood asthma to cancer because so much truck traffic and diesel locomotives to a lesser extent in the Inland Empire. And we'd like to propose uh, just evaluation of electrification of trucks and trains as a mitigation to that, um, including study of electrification of, from Fullerton to Riverside San Bernardino um, for short haul electric freight trains to the ports. Um, the US rail industry has long resisted <laughs> electrification. And I think it's time to push back on that. And I think the High Speed Rail Authority is appropriate to push back on that and promote electrification of freight rail. Thank you, Mr. Yannity, and uh, we appreciate your comment. Have a good day. Mr. Chairman, we have next up Jean Perry Adelin. Okay. I'm sorry, is it, did you say Dean Perry? Oh, Jean. it's. Oh, Jean, I'm sorry. Jean Perry, Adi, uh, welcome back. Uh, hi, my name is actually John Pierre Adelin. Uh, J E. A N hyphen P I E R R E. Uh, I'm a teenager. I'm 15 years old. I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I like the California High Speed Rail Project because it's the first like real high speed rail project in uh, the United States. And uh, what I would like to propose is that instead of focusing on the Merced to Bakersfield section, uh, I think first what the authority should do is. Uh, focus on a route from San Francisco to San, San Jose because uh, there's, a, there's a huge uh, ridership population there and I feel that it would be, it would, uh, it would, the project would time would be much shorter for that section of the project and it would, it would uh, bring support, more support for the project. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to take this time to go over the instructions as we had a few members of the public join after the initial instructions were given. So for members of the public who wish to provide public comment by dialing in by your phone, pressing pound two will raise your hand and put you into our queue. Speakers will be called in the order that their hand is raised. For those who wish to provide public comment via the Zoom application, Please use the raise your hand feature typically located at the bottom of your screen so that we may call on you to provide your public comment. Next up for public comment, we have Roland Lebrun. Good morning, uh, Mr. Lebrun. Good morning, Mr. Lebrun. Hello. I'm not uh, hearing anything, uh, Mo. I don't know if you are or not. No, I'm not hearing anything. I think he might be having technical difficulties. Okay. Go to the next speaker and come back. Yeah. None of the other attendees have raised their hand. Okay. Actually, um, attendee just raised their hand. We have next up, Teresa Bowie. Okay. Good morning, Ms. Bowie. Good morning. Uh, my name is Teresa Bowie, spelled B-U-I. I am the State Climate Campaign Director for Pacific Environment. Uh, Pacific Environment is a California-based global environmental organization, and we're the state's only NGO consultative status with the International Maritime Organization which sets global shipping law. I'm providing comments on the sustainability update. Um, we uh, would encourage you to, in discussions, to not leave out the shipping industry's impact. 
Um, on February 1st, 2021, the state unveiled its definition of vehicles under the executive order to include marine vessels. And so um, under the off-road vehicles, there's the 10% zero emission off-road equipment. And by 2035, full transition to zero um, emission off-road equipment, we would encourage you to also consider um, uh, the equipment surrounding shipping ports. Ships are one of the worst air polluters in the state of California. The South Coast Air Quality Management projects that by 2023, ocean going ships will surpass heavy duty diesel trucks to become Southern California's largest source of smog um, forming nitrogen oxide pollution. So again, we would encourage you to not um, exclude the shipping industry's impact. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Boy. good point. And thank you for joining us. Mr. Chairman, we're gonna try Roland again. Okay. Good morning, Mr. LeBron. Mr. Secretary, the prompt to unmute has been delivered. Mr. Chairman, let's move on to a next attendee for public comment and try to get rolling again after that. Next up, we have Mona Cummings. Ms. Cummings, good morning and welcome. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to make a comment today. So my name is Mona Yandoro Cummings and I'm the CEO of Tree Fresno. And I wanted to make a comment um, about uh, the grant that we received through High Speed Rail, which is managed uh, through CAL FIRE. Um, we're actually at the very end of this million dollar grant to where we had committed to planting 2,400 trees in schools, parks, and residential areas in communities, especially disadvantaged communities in the greater Fresno region, um, offsetting sort of the environmental impacts of the building of the high-speed rail. And I'm pleased to report that we've planted nearly 3,000 trees with this funding. So we're very um, excited um, that we have uh, all of this water-wise um, large canopy trees out in our communities. Uh, we have planted in places such as Corcoran, Dinuba, Fresno, Fowler, Hanford, Huron, Kingsburg, Mendota, Reedley, San Joaquin, Orange Cove, and more. Uh, some of our larger plantings include uh, one that we'll finish up this weekend, uh, what we call Earth Day Saturday, at Green Valley Recycling in Southwest Fresno, and that's 361 trees right under the high-speed rail uh, near Golden State and 99. So I wanted to uh, just express my thanks um, for um, allowing Tree Fresno this opportunity to plant these trees and to engage our community in this very important work. Thank you, Mona, and uh, thanks for the good work that Tree Fresno does for not only Fresno, but the Central Valley. And don't forget to keep the trees uh, trimmed underneath, the, underneath our uh, <laughs> structures. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much, okay. Cheers. Good. Mr. Chairman, we have next up Dean Flores. Good morning, Mr. Flores, and welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I hope you can hear me. We hear you well, and, and welcome, uh, welcome, Senator. Thank you, thank you. It's good hearing from everyone. I just wanted to uh, just make a, a quick comment and open and open um, that uh, you know I have worked on this project for a good many years and feel very fortunate to just take a moment to say thank you to everyone on this board who is serving so diligently and continue to kind of push this project forward. Uh, I remember when we first started this project um, and I was very fortunate to sit on the board in the early days, but I am beyond just listening today, I just wanted to tell each and every board member, thank you for your service, thank you for your dedication and for all the hard questions that you're asking uh, for Californians. I think it's definitely an, an amazing transformation uh, project and this board has been part and parcel of that. So I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you I know that uh, you've got a lot of hard things ahead of you, but every once in a while, I think the board just needs to be recognized for its great work. So thank you for all you're doing. Thank you, Senator. And um, thank you for your ongoing uh, leadership in California. Uh, we don't hear about it a lot, but 
we know a lot about what you're doing behind the scenes. And it's, it's very much appreciated. And thanks again for taking the time to address us this Thank morning. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna just take this moment to go over the instructions for providing public comment for the attendees who just joined us. If you're logged into this meeting via the Zoom application, please use the raise your hand feature typically located at the bottom of your screen so that we may call on you to provide your public comment. Next up for public comment is Roland Lebrun again. Good, good morning, Mr. Lebrun. Good morning, can you hear me now? We've got you loud and clear, thank you. All right, I apologize for that wrong device earlier on. So two things. So first of all, I'd like to second the, the, the comment the gentleman uh, made earlier about uh, prioritizing electrification, including freight electrification. I believe I mentioned in the past that every single country in the world that currently is operating a successful high speed rail network started with elect electrification at least 50, five zero years before they even started thinking about designing their first high speed line. The French high speed rail network is over 10,000 miles but they've only got one, one and a half thousand miles of actual high-speed lines in that network. Now, um, the other thing I want to bring to your attention is a follow-up to the discussion you just had that um, um, uh, administration and finance, is that it is essential that Mr. Kelly restores every single board meeting, agenda meetings, recordings, and everything, because that's the only way that we are ever going to be able to get right down to the bottom, how we could possibly have messed up high-speed rail so badly in the state of California in the last 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LeBron. Mr. Chairman, we don't have any of the attendees raising their hand currently at the moment. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, how many people do you show uh, still uh, with us who may or may not be wanting to speak? Uh, we have about eight attendees on the Zoom application. Okay, all right. Well, let us move uh, move forward uh, into our our agenda. And before I actually start that, I just wanted to take a moment uh, on behalf of all of the members of the board and management to um, thank uh, very much the, the staff behind the scenes who have made and continue to make these meetings possible uh, in this uh, techno technical age that we're in. So thank you, Scott and Justin and Natalie and Alicia and Mo. Um, you're doing a great job. We couldn't make it through it uh, without you. We promise that and we appreciate very much the service that you provide to the state and to the authority. Moving forward, let me also, as we start into the agenda, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the public, we're going to uh, go slightly out of order here in the agenda that has been published uh, for the purpose of giving you some background on the action items. So we're gonna move after we have the action uh, on the, for consideration for the action on the board minutes, we're going to go to agenda item number three, which will give a good deal of background for the action item that is agenda item number two. So first, uh, starting with agenda item number one, uh, colleagues, if, if there are no changes to the uh, minutes of March 25th, can we have a motion for approval? So moved. So moved. And a second, please. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you, passed unanimously. Moving on that now to agenda item number three, this is the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, NEPA, uh, as it's known, uh, and an update. And uh, it's going to be presented for us by um, Mr. Sanch. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, members of the board, Chairman Richards, Vice Chair Miller. Uh, my name is Serge Stanich. I am the director of the Environmental Services Program for California High Speed Rail Authority. Uh, I'm relatively new to this program, uh, accepting the appointment in mid-November of 2020, uh, but I've been with the program since uh, summer of 2015 uh, in various roles working with the consultant. So I'm both very honored and humbled to be uh, here and uh, excited about this new opportunity. 
So I'll, I'll give a little bit of an update on the NEPA assignment program. Uh, California High Speed Rail Authority applied for, can we advance the slide please? Um, California High Speed Rail Authority applied for NEPA assignment in uh, early 2018. Um, it was posted in the Federal Register in 2018, June, and in July of 2019, the FRA and the State of California executed the Memorandum of Understanding that uh, allowed the authority to take over all of the federal responsibilities under the National Environmental Policy Act. It's really important to note that California is actually the first rail or transit agency in the United States to get this opportunity. Uh, it's a program that California Department of Transportation has had for uh, nearly 20 years or at least 15. Um, and so we're very excited about the opportunity and it's already demonstrated tremendous success for the authority. Uh, this opportunity or the granting of the MOU uh, uh, requires that the authority essentially comply with all of the National Environmental Policy Act and other federal responsibilities. Uh, however, the FRA retains uh, a couple of items as required by statute, and that is uh, to make the air quality conformity determination and tribal uh, government consultations. As part of the MOU, um, the FRA um, delegated or the authority is responsible to implement NEPA, but we're also required uh, to update our policies and procedures, to provide training to staff, ensure compliance with all of the other federal laws and regulations, such as the Endangered Species Act or the National Historic Preservation Act, and we're required to conduct self-assessments. Uh, we completed our first self-assessment in the summer fall of 2020. And that assessment is then presented to the FRA to conduct uh, an annual audit. We'll be doing audits for the first four years. Um, FRA essentially evaluates whether the authority is in conformance um, and then provides recommendations. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Um, and so we've just completed uh, the first audit. Uh, the FRA did the uh, interviews of both authority staff and outside agencies in December of 2020. Uh, this audit covered uh, decisions by the authority since we uh, got NEPA assignment in July of 2019 through June 30th of 2020. And the audit results were just published yesterday in the Federal Register. So as part of this um, presentation, I've included the link down at the bottom where should the public want to make comments, they can do so. Uh, the results are kind of understated, but they do acknowledge the success of the authority. And I pulled it directly from the Re Federal Register here. Uh, overall, the authority, CHSRA, has carried out the environmental responsibilities assumed through the Section 327 MOU, and the audit team found that the authority is complying with the Section 327 MOU. This is a success. While understated, this demonstrates all the hard work that the authority has been able to do uh, and demonstrate compliance. So the audit will be in the Federal Register or the results for 30 days, uh, and then we'll complete the uh, audit and publish a final uh, in 60 days or after 60 days. Next slide, please. So what have we been able to accomplish? Well, since we've gotten NEPA assignment, the authority has finalized the two environmental documents providing full environmental clearance for both project sections in the Central Valley from Merced through Fresno to Bakersfield. Uh, the authority finalized the EIS for the Fresno to Bakersfield locally generated alternative in October of 2018. And the Central Valley Y final EIR EIS was executed by the authority in September of 2020. As part of the construction in the Central Valley, we routinely evaluate whether any of the fine um, changes uh, result in changes to uh, the environmental document. Uh, we've completed 22 re-exams for the construction packages. And most notable is that the authority was able to publish four environmental documents. Um, these are not listed in order, but in February of last year, the authority published Bakersfield and Palmdale draft EIR EIS, followed by San Jose to Merced in the spring, Burbank to Los Angeles in the late summer, and then uh, San Francisco to San Jose in the fall. Uh, this was uh, quite a remarkable achievement that uh, essentially evaluated and start the clearance for an additional 200 miles of the alignment. Uh, next slide, please. So as part of NEPA assignment, we have the requirement, the obligation to provide clearance under our own phase one program or project sections from San Francisco through Anaheim. But the, author or the FRA is also delegated to the authority, the responsibility to provide NEPA clearance or NEPA evaluation for what we call off-system projects. 
So two of the projects uh, specifically identified in the MOU are the uh, LA Metro Link US, which provides the clearance of the modernization of the LA Union Station, as well as the San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission uh, Diamond Grade um, or Diamond Diamond Stockton Diamond uh, Grade Separation Project. Pardon me. Uh, the Stockton Diamond is a project by the San Joaquin Regional Rail to bring the Altamont Corridor Express over to uh, the Central Valley. And uh, that's a summary of uh, the NEPA assignment program and uh, kind of leads into the next discussion of the delegation of authority. So next slide, um, I'm available for any questions. All right, any questions for Mr. Stanich? Hearing none, uh, congratulations on your new uh, position and uh, we'll look forward to having you address us many times. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Rich. Okay, thank you. Uh, colleagues, we'll now move on to uh, uh, agenda item number two, which is the consideration of amending existing uh, board CEO delegation policy regarding environmental review issues. And I believe you're uh, up again, so you're, 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 you're taking the invitation well. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm excited to have Alicia Fowler as a, a partner uh, in delivering this presentation to you. So I'll, I'll or present on the first few slides. Right. Uh, if we can go ahead and move to the next slide, please. So the delegation of authority was last updated in September of 2019. Uh, and this was just uh, essentially two months after uh, the FRA and the uh, state of California executed the MOU. So there is some remnant language in the delegation of authority that is quite frankly outdated. Uh, it uses the conditional tense, if the FRA were to grant um, NEPA assignment. Uh, it has uh, coordination with the FRA regarding the review of the environmental documents. And there's no uh, separation or distinguishing between um, full EIR EISs and lower projects uh, or lesser complex projects such as environmental assessments or EAs and, um, and uh, FONSIs or categorical exclusions. Um, and this gets to be a bit awkward, quite frankly, as we're reviewing some of these off-system off projects like the LA Metro Link US or the Stockton Diamond Project. Next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit more clarification as to the elements that we'd want to correct. Um, currently, local sponsors uh, would have to go through the California High Speed Rail Authority board approval on both a preferred alternative and to finalize a record of decision. Um, and uh, so what we're, the, the problem with that is that one, it would put the authority board uh, somewhat in conflict with other state agencies regarding the approval of the project. For example, LA Metro is another agency responsible under the California Environmental Quality Act and chartered to review their project. Um, but it also um, essentially prohibits some of the intended streamlining benefits of the FAST Act, which was the uh, Federal Department of Transportation bill in 2015 that allowed some of these streamlining activities with NEPA assignment and by which the authority applied for NEPA assignment. Um, and so if we can move to the next slide, please. What we're seeking to do is to update this language within the delegation of authority. Um, so eliminate the outdated information regarding uh, coordination with the FRA, um, but true up the opportunities for compliance with the FAST Act and provide greater clarity regarding the CEO's decision-making authority. Now, it's, I want to be very clear, um, we would not be removing any of the um, uh, authority of the board uh, to approve the on-system projects. So preferred alternatives, amendments uh, to the preferred alternative, the um, uh, final uh, EIR, EIS certification and directing the authority to sign the ROD for the on-system projects that's retained, and we're not proposing to change that. Uh, this would simply clarify and allow the CEO to concur with a locally sponsored uh, alternative, such as the LA Metro project, and then to sign the, um, the record of decision. This element to sign the record of decision is, is very important because what it would allow LA Metro to do is to incorporate another element of the FAST Act, which is to publish a final EIR or final EIS 
and record of decision combined. Uh, under the uh, preceding guidelines for NEPA, once you publish the final EIS, there's a quote unquote cooling off period and the lead agency cannot execute a rod um, no, in less than 30 days. So it's at least a 30 day delay and depending on other actions could be, could be considerably more. So this delegation of authority, the corrections would actually uh, improve that streamlining for our off system projects. Can you advance to the next slide please? Um, and so this is this is the crux of the presentation here, where we would distinguish between the local sponsor projects and the authorities on system projects. So um, clarify that the CEO is authorized to approve a locally sponsored um, uh, preferred alternative, and then also sign a, a record of decision. Um, and then also kind of expand on that. While the authority is already granted for the uh, the direct the CEO to sign categorical exclusions. Uh, this uh, clarification or update of the DOA would then also grant that uh, in clearer language for the CEO to do so on our off-system projects. And I believe that's the last slide in the presentation. So um, Alicia, if you would kind of walk through what the resolution it would be. Sure. Good morning, board members. Um, we have a resolution attached to your materials and then perhaps more importantly, the red line version of the delegation of authority we're proposing adopting in that resolution. Um, and then the other thing we did include in your materials was that NEPA assignment MOU uh, it really just laid out uh, as, as Serge defined the agreement between ourselves and the FRA, including on these locally sponsored projects. Um, so resolution language, really you guys would be uh, moving forward or voting on uh, amending the delegation of authority in the in alignment with the redlined uh, delegation of authority provided to you as part of these materials, which include changes to H sections H two and H three, um, and as presented uh, to you in this board meeting. I don't know if we have any questions about the actual action we're at we're uh, seeking today, or just anything else on this item. Um, there's no other, is there any other pre presentation by you, Mr. Stanis, where uh, you're completed with what you had to say? Yeah, that concludes the presentation, but we're available for any questions. Okay, honestly. great. All right, then, uh, do any of uh, my colleagues have uh, any questions for either uh, Ms. Fowler or Mr. Stanich? I do, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, Director uh, Escusha. Thank you. No, I just wanted to confirm again, Alicia and Serge, in the actual resolution, the language, as I was reading it, it's only limited, this delegation of authority is only limited to projects that are not high-speed rail authority projects, correct? That's correct. Correct. All right. You, and also, you are, you are and basically, and basically, you know, this aligns uh, to NEPA. Th this type of, um, you know, uh, statutory delegation aligns to NEPA, correct? That's correct. So, for example, as you well know, I was extremely interested in what happened to Fairmead in terms of the environmental impact in that community, as well as what's happening to uh, Wasco in terms of the farm labor housing project. So, what I'm, am I correct in saying that this delegation of authority will not impact those type of projects like Fairmead and Wasco because those are high-speed real authority projects and therefore the board still has authority to oversee that, correct? Absolutely. That's correct, yes. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Martha. Any other questions for uh, either uh, Sturge or uh, Alicia? I have a question and I think- Yes, yes, uh, direct, uh, Vice Chair uh, Miller. Uh, so, does this include if we comment on a local project and we are not in support of it or we have a problem there's a community issue it is um just just walk me through that I, i'm assuming that would not uh occur but does this incur the i mean does this include comments we're making on other people's projects where there might be a disagreement or i guess i should say if there is a disagreement at what point do you bring it to the board level I mean, um, I'll start, Serge. I mean, this delegation uh, uh, doesn't 
impact anything off our alignment or outside the few projects the MOU uh, gives us NEPA assignment over. So lots of other things going on locally that oh, sure. yeah. we, would, we, we would not even be touching in this delegation. So and you wouldn't might be able to speak better to what we would do in those instances. Uh, I can elaborate on that a bit. Um, uh, without NEPA assignment, the authority would have had no jurisdiction on these off system projects. That's not to say that the authority would not have been able to comment on these projects. Um, we, we have a working relationship with the LA Metro as our system will interface with their system. Um, but the NEPA assignment MOU essentially directed the California High Speed Rail Authority to provide the activities that the FRA was doing to ensure compliance with NEPA uh, and with all federal regulations. Um, and uh, so, Director Escutia, to your concerns regarding environmental justice, we have a team of environmental professionals, fully qualified, that we refer to as our NEPA assignment team. Uh, that review the LA Metro's documents to ensure that they have done uh, the outreach, that they have done the coordination, that they are making uh, the appropriate analysis and coordination to ensure that uh, disadvantaged communities are well represented and engaged in their projects. Uh, but the NEPA assignment MOU essentially just transfers that NEPA responsibility. Should the authority have concerns and the authority board have concerns on a project, um, this would not um, obviate the ability to comment or influence a project, um, but this is really limited to the authority's review under the policies procedures for uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Council on Environmental Quality um, guidelines, um, and the other executive orders. So that's that. Therein is our responsibility and what this delegation of authority tries to to balance. But Nancy, if I may, because I think Nancy, you're pointing you're pointing out something that I also intuitively something is just does not sit well with me. Um, and now for you to even pick up on that, you know, it, it makes me want to ask some more questions. First of all, the resolution I think is divided into three parts. The first part was to um, uh, to um, align this to NEPA, correct? Right. The second part is to give Brian authority. Um, frankly, what are considered, I guess, low level environmental actions, correct? That's correct. That's correct. I'll be honest with you, the first two, those first two parts, I have no problem with. It's the third part that I think Nancy's also picking up on what I picked up when I spoke to you guys on Monday. And that is the third part in terms of local, local projects and, and the involvement of us as a board. Now, let me give you an example regarding USA, US Link, which is out of, out of, um, you you uh union station in la and yes that's a project from um the local agency the mta and yes high speed rail is in, you know gave a substantial amount of money to make that hopefully a a reality well a couple of months before that even happened i was personally approached by a state senator and by some community members about not enough um community meetings being being done uh, I think by the MTA, and so they came to me as a board member of High Speed Rail, and I spoke to Brian about that, and Brian was very generous in terms of allowing more time for community input as a result of the pandemic, so I really, really appreciate that. Now, if this third part of the resolution goes into effect, does that mean then that that Community members cannot approach me as a board member to seek more opportunity for community input. Because from the way I read the resolution, the MTA has a project, US Link, US Metro Link, US Link. They approve it, the MTA board approves it. And then according to this resolution, Brian would then have the authority to immediately sign off on that instead of bringing it up to the board of directors. Is that correct? That's correct. However, 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 all right. I want to okay. I want to hear the however. I need to. I need to weigh in here because the specific example that you just cited, which I recall very clearly, and you're right, it had to do with the entryway, the entrance right. egress into the LA Union Station. That dialogue, that outreach, and those meetings were not tied to the LA Union Station project, but to our 
our Burbank to LA stretch. And that, and that is not uh, escaping board approval and review. And so no, I know I appreciate that, Brian, but let's assume that it was uh, an MTA project. And for some reason, there was not enough, you know, um, community, whatever um, interaction on the part of the MTA board. And I know that I spoke about this, about, you know, community groups getting a second bite at the apple in terms of, you know, trying to do their advocacy at the local agency level. And if that fails, then do they go up to high speed rail? I mean, I I guess the reason why I feel a little bit uncomfortable, and I think you guys sensed this on Monday, was because, you know, um, at the at one point, yes, the local agency should be responsible for managing the community relations, you know? But at the same time, you know, um, to I guess to deny people the opportunity to 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 advocate. You know, um, I'm just trying to figure out a way, maybe there's a way that we can split the app, you know, split the baby here, you know, trying to to at least not shut down community participation, you know, still give you the the authority that you need, you know, consistent with NEPA, but but at the same time, not shut down community interaction. That that's all that's I'm trying to be solemn in here. I'm trying to find some yeah. kind of a solution. I know on uh Director uh, Boutros, uh, in our conversation the other day in this briefing, raised this question about notification uh, to the board uh, in terms of providing an opportunity for the entity or the local sponsor to at least uh, present wh where they are to the board on the matter and allowing an opportunity for that dialogue to occur. And so, and again, maybe there is something there that, that helps in this regard. I'm happy as the CEO to provide my own notification to the board about I'm about to do this kind of thing and and, and, and sort of have a, you know, a, a check-in that this is uh, ready to go um, uh, and I'm proposed. So I think some kind of notification working off of both your concern and what Andre raised the other day, sorry, Director Boutros raised the other day. Right. Um, uh, uh, we go way back, <laughs> but uh, maybe maybe that's the way to 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 solve this. And so, uh, 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 Director Boudros, you, you your hand up. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know I, I think that's really the best approach, Brian. I think there there are responsibilities as a responsible agency, which which this board is. I mean, we we have to differentiate between the lead agency, who is in this case would be the Metro Board and the responsible agency, which is the authority. Yes, the authority board can delegate the responsibility to the CEO. However, I think it would be really helpful to lay before the board some of the potential issues that are being discussed at the local level that the board may not really be necessarily familiar with, or at least may not have heard of um, from, from a, a, a technical presentation standpoint. You know, they may have heard individually from uh, members of the communities of a particular concern. But I think if we can package a presentation that lays out some of the issues that the local board is, is dealing with uh, prior to taking the final action on the document and pr prior to you as the CEO under this delegation, you know, sign off on that. I think that would be really helpful and healthy uh, from a lot of different aspects, one being transparency, one being really for the board to fulfill their responsibilities under a responsible agency act. Um, I, I believe those would resolve some of the issues that are being mentioned, whether it's by uh, Director Miller or Director Scutia. Thank you, uh, Director Boutros. Uh, Director Perea? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, some of the questions asked by some of the board members are the some of the questions that I had. But just so I understand more clearly, using the example that they're talking about now, under the existing rules without this policy, what would be the difference in the discussion and the timing of that discussion and the board decision making on that issue? Um, under the existing uh, delegation of authority, uh, LA Metro would go to their board uh, for uh, approval of a locally sponsored um, 
um, alternative uh, for CEQA. Uh, and then the authority, our staff, myself, um, would come to the board seeking uh, approval of the locally sponsored preferred alternative prior to publishing an environmental document. Um, the uh, LA Metro would continue to lead all of the outreach, uh, work with their consultants on developing the technical studies. After the document is published, they'd respond to comments and continue the engagement with the communities. Uh, when we approach the final EIR EIS, um, they would uh, do a similar action where they would have to go to their board uh, and seek uh, approval of the preferred alternative. Uh, and similarly, they would come to ours. Um, we would have to go to the board uh, to approve the uh, the NEPA document before uh, directing the CEO to sign it. Um, they would be able to uh, publish uh, that final, but it could be um, several months um, uh, between at least 30 to probably a few months, quite frankly, between the final EIR, EIS, and the record of decision. So that would cut, you know, contribute additional costs or schedule delays to our local sponsors or our partners. Okay, so so the issue of taking our board out of the decision making process is an issue of timing, shortening the timing to get something done. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, it, it it is a matter of timing. Um, the FAST Act that provided for a NEPA assignment for the rail agencies and by which we actually applied for it. Um, has a, an element of streamlining. Um, NEPA is intended to try to provide or has been, you know, trying to provide streamlining activities. And so the inclusion or the identification of a preferred alternative in the draft was one element of this uh, document streamlining and publishing a record of decision with the final uh, was also an element of the streamlining. So uh, this authorization essentially would align the authority's practices to be consistent with the federal regulations. Um, and uh, I mean, there, there's provisions in there that you know, the agencies are directed to do this whenever possible. Um, but I think you know, there's a, a larger issue regarding uh, who is the lead agency uh, with respect to authorizing these projects um, and what is just simple NEPA compliance. Uh, and that's where the authority has entered into this ambiguity by taking on uh, the NEPA compliance oversight and uh, decisions of the board. Mr. Okay. Chairman, if I, if yeah, I, if I, I might, that, I just, I, sorry, if I could just add one, I'm trying to find the right analogy here for what we're, we're yeah. trying to do, but, as Serge noted in his earlier presentation, the CEQA, uh, sorry, the NEPA assignment uh, activity has been around for 15 to 20 years now. Prior to us getting it, it was all done on the highway side. And so in that case, while there's an example of the state sort of having uh, this NEPA assignment uh, role where you have to ensure that, uh, you know, that, they, that all of the NEPA uh, steps have been followed, which we, we still have to do. On the highway side, for example, where Caltrans approves uh, a project, a CEQA project, and they uh, may have to go to the CTC, a public board much like ours, to discuss that. The CTC does not, in my recollection, and I know uh, Andre Boutros will have a, a better sense of this than me, but I don't believe that there's a separate uh, NEPA approval at the CTC. Uh, for the Caltrans project. And so that's what we're trying to avoid here. We're, we're trying to apply the NEPA, uh, the NEPA standard the same without requiring our public board to, to play a role that they, we don't otherwise play yeah. for uh, these assignments. So that, that's why I'm trying to think mm -hmm. whether notification is the right thing. And then there is this separate issue that I hate to complicate matters, but on smaller project elements that have where there's a finding of no significance or no impact. The other idea is to allow that to be uh, uh, approved at the staff level as opposed to bring back to the board. So with that, you know, Andre, maybe help, help no, me. That, that yeah. uh, let me, Andre, let, Andre, please respond. Yeah, let, let me just, uh, yeah, let, let me just, uh, uh, a, a couple of points that Brian mentioned. The, the NEPA uh, assignment is given directly to Caltrans, so the commission is really not involved in that aspect. So they did not name the commission as a responsible agency. 
And this, in this case, the authority is named as a responsible agency. So we have to, dis to distinguish between the, these two things. The commission is a responsible agency for the CEQA, uh, for, for a document that may have uh, state funding uh, allotted to a project. So the commission would actually uh, act as a responsible agency if there are state monies involved in a project. So some of those projects do go to the commission for um, uh, action, um, you know, to, to essentially, essentially concurrence, you know, to move the project forward only if there is state money involved in the project. So they weren't really given the authority under NEPA to act as a responsible agency, but under CEQA, they are a responsible agency that acts really similar to what this board would be uh, expected to do uh, for a project uh, that fits under the NEPA delegation. Thank you, uh, Director Correa. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Serge, another question, and I don't know if this applies as an example, but the gentleman that spoke earlier with respect to the Inland Empire and with the rail yard um, and his his desire for electrification versus not and all, would that fall at any point under NEPA? And how uh, would it, you yeah, it absolutely does. The the project section that he is referring to is LA to Anaheim. That's part of phase one. Um, and uh, uh, it, it uh, the authority is obligated to uh, to comply not just with CECA but with the National Environmental Policy Act and has to consider the environmental justice, the air quality considerations, and right. and uh, how our work with BNSF will be integrated to ensure um, full compliance and protection of the resources. That that's right. not excluded by this delegation of authority. That's correct. This is something that activity would absolutely come to the board and is provided for in this delegation of authority. So. Nothing about the LA to Anaheim project or the authorities work uh, in Colton uh, would be changed by any means with this delegation of authority. Um, and the, in, in that instance, the California High Speed Rail Authority is the lead agency, both under CEQA and under NEPA. The LA Metro project has um, this other element where the LA Metro board would be taking the action um, and um, it, not uh, advancing this delegation of authority would put an element of um, a challenge or awkwardness between California High Speed Rail Authority as an agency and the LA Metro Board uh, as an agency regarding approving the project. So the, the intention with NEPA assignment is essentially to ensure that the authority staff are demonstrating um, and ensuring that these off-system projects comply with NEPA and with all the various federal laws and regulations. And so it's, it wasn't intended to create this um, potential conflict between the two state agencies. Okay, so in this case, these two examples, say Inland Empire, we would be the lead agency. So this action today would not apply to that. This board would still have full voting authority. That's absolutely that. correct. But That's in this particular correct. case, and what this policy covers is, is basically when we are in the second seat, the second chair. Is that, am I hearing yes. that correctly? Yes, I, 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 I hesitate a bit to put the authority, California Street Rail Authority, in the second chair. Um, but yes, it puts this institution essentially in an oversight role with respect to NEPA, uh, but not necessarily project approval. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, just help me out in this last question because sure, you know the, the the one thing that that I think many boards you know there's different keys in a process so that we ensure maximum voice for the public. And, and when I read this document, it it had a feeling of taking away the potential voice from a community when they can't access, in this case, our board, who would have a quote decision making uh, point on the issue to help them resolve whatever their issues, as opposed to us being in a position of asking our CEO, hey, did you think about this or how about this? But at the end of the day, this action gives our CEO basically over action and authority over the board. We'd be giving up that authority. And I have a little bit of a problem with that, but I'm just trying to understand it. Okay, if us being in that second chair, for lack of a better term, over another agency that hopefully have done their homework and listen to the community, then that should not be a problem. Is that? 
right? Not right? Uh, how do you? Uh, I, I, I mean, I believe the concern is valid. I recognize um, the the board members here's uh, interest in ensuring full transparency and engagement with the various communities. Um, I, I would argue that that first responsibility is LA Metro's responsibility. They're, they are obligated under the California Environmental Quality Act, under the National Environmental Policy Act, with the authority staff looking over their shoulder to, to fully engage on all of these resource concerns and community concerns. Um, and, uh, and, and it would not eliminate the, that work being done uh, to, um, uh, to Director Boutros's concerns. Uh, we, we had always, or we considered you know, bringing to the board uh, routinely uh, informational items uh, to discuss and, you know, potentially even with the, the Metro's action, doing a joint presentation where uh, uh, my counterpart there, we would partner to do a presentation to the board on some of the off-system projects that we're partnering with uh, to facilitate not just the high-speed rail program, but uh, transit and the state rail plan in, in, in general. Um, I mean, our, our relationship with Metro is very good. They have um, a complex project that has already cleared the CEQA document. They, um, they faced some similar challenges back in 2018 and 2019 that we did uh, when the FRA uh, distanced themselves. Um, uh, but now that we have, you know, um, NEPA assignment and uh, an active and engaged federal partner, um, you know, we, we see their project advancing. They still have challenges, and I, I don't mean to dismiss the challenges that they have with their communities and with their uh, freight and transit partners, but uh, it's a project that's going well, and the authority is partnering with them to deliver that. So uh, I, I can still see us coming to our board uh, and presenting as an informational item and, and, and hearing commentary on that. But this delegation of authority is really intended to align with the FAST Act and with what NEPA intended, so. Understood, yeah, and I appreciate your, you know, your presentation because it does make sense, what, or it's logical what you're saying. My only concern, and I, as I'm listening to other board members speak, is, is just that, if, if for some reason that community still has an issue and that needs fine tuning, if it comes to our board as an informational item, I think we all know, mean, you know what that means it's just an information item and it means nothing and our board will have no say and i guess that's my concern of, about the board giving up more and more of its authority uh but i understand thank you for your presentation thank you mr chairman thank you director Perea. uh vice chair uh, miller um so i really believe in the fast act i think it there's a lot of efficiencies there because the CEQA nepa process is very long very cumbersome and i do think that there's a lot of public interaction and i don't want to be a second guesser on local la met or any other local agencies um, projects unless it it affects our project so i think what i was getting at brian if there was a a comment that we had made as a responsible agency or as the oversight um, agency on NEPA that we didn't feel um, had been uh, uh, completely addressed. In other words, there was a controversy. Does it then come to our board or do you just handle that? Serge, under the, let me ask Serge, because under the, under the NEPA process um, right now, FRA has, you know, has the role, if it was not delegated to us, FRA would have the role about as to whether or not a local agency has met the standards of the act. That's and under the, under the delegation, we make that determination now. So we would, we would, we would do that using our NEPA compliance team that we've actually had to form. And we have a unit here that, that, that evaluates that and they, they would have to make that determination. And so, that typically is not, I don't think that's something we necessarily bring to the board, that compliance determination. I think the, the issue is here, um, as they move toward, as a lead agency moves, you know, we, I guess I'd say it this way, we gotta make that determination in filling the shoes of the FRA. The question is, do we need to bring that to a public vote to this board uh, in every instance? And, and I guess that's the question, or can we make that determination and move forward once that determination is made by our, our team? And I guess the question I would 
ask in trying to navigate or, or stealing Director Scutia's term, be, be Solomon-like on this. Is there a way either if it's relevant to a preferred alternative or a, uh, you know, the, the moving of a, of a rod for an off-system project, of which I want to remind the members we have two right now, the LA Union Station project, the Stockton Diamond project, that's it. So on those two, I guess the question is, is there something like notification from me to the board via letter that, you know, so like this is coming, this is what we're inclined to do and, and you know, wait for any uh, reaction from the board to that. Or um, as Andre sort of suggested the other day in our briefing, um, as one of our two local project sponsors are moving to the NEPA stage or per alternative stage, have them at, at request or, or, or uh, you know, ask them to uh, d describe to our board what they're doing, what that is, you know. And so that either one of those to me are ways to sort of help make sure that communication is, is flowing through, but we can continue to, to move and take actions. And so I, I don't know if either of those help, but maybe that's, maybe that's the path to go down. Yeah, you're, you're addressing a couple of the things that I've been thinking about while my colleagues have been uh, making their comments. One is how often is this likely to happen? And it's, you can't, you can't say that with certainty, but I mean, it, it, it's not something that's going to happen on a regular basis. And you've, I think you've got, uh, I, I think what you're talking about with some sort of notification makes sense. And I think it complies with, I, I think, concerns that, uh, that Director Scusha made and comments that Vice Chair Miller made and can all tie in also with what uh, Director Boutros suggested. If you took the other approach that you just, the other alternative just now that you mentioned, Brian, with regards to what would what would it mean that their board presents uh, to this board? Would it mean it's just a document? I think we've got to keep in mind, we're trying to move the process as efficiently and timely as possible. So we're not trying to create more work, but what would that mean? I mean, I, I guess I would say, uh, you know, the way I'm thinking about this, and and you know, again, Director Boutros had had some of this thought the other day. But you know, is there just at some point in the process that's sort of out, maybe outside of what they're doing to get to a rod, so it, it doesn't add a whole new list of requirements on them, but but is you know, you know, directing us in the resolution, if you will, to you know, uh, b before. Uh, before they're at that stage that there is an invitation to come address our board on how they're moving forward on that on that project toward Iran. I don't I don't know something like that or my alternative was a notification from me to the board saying we have received this preferred alternative we've received this uh, uh, you know they're ready to move to a rod uh, our staff determination is as follows I'm notifying the board this of this with this letter and then the board could make a determination whether that's okay or you want to you want somebody wants to okay i'm, I think, kind, of, I'm kind of open either way i, I, no, I don't. yeah i think in what you're saying and i think that listening i think the notification can really com, can really address the concerns and i don't want to speak for any of those who have spoken but just listening can address the concerns that i think that what we've heard and that is that before an action's taken we're at least notified and also perhaps notified of any comments that you think that you may have on it. And so the notification would occur in advance of, of any uh, action that you took with the authority that, uh, that this would provide. I, want, I just want to know, yes, uh, Andre? Andre, go ahead. I, um, I, I'll, I'll be okay with that notification only if it is shared publicly at a public meeting, because otherwise, uh, we're not really being uh, open and transparent. Yeah. Um, and, and, and go ahead, Nancy. Um, I, I don't know that we're not being open and transparent. It's a very transparent process. That whole, that whole process is very open and transparent. We're delegating something to Brian at this point. He, he notifies us. I mean, I think you could add, add that to the back of a board packet. I certainly don't think it needs to be a board item. Um, uh, 
I, do, I don't, because I do want it to be a fast project, process. I don't want to have any delay in that because I know that it is a, a way to make this process move more efficiently. So I'm okay with notification. May I ask a question? Uh, I, again, I, I you know apologize for this, but I want to make sure that we are doing two things. One, I want to make sure that we are uh, addressing the board's very legitimate concerns, which I appreciate. But I also want to make sure that we are achieving what we're intending to achieve with the with the idea of doing the delegated authority. And there are, as again, Director Scutia pointed out, there are separate parts of this. And so the one concern is, and, and I guess Director Boutros, I want to look at you first on this. Look at is, me. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, uh, the primarily, I would think those concerns, and, and if this is the wrong distinction, I also want to invite Serge and and Alicia to get in this, but um, is the primary concern might be if they're moving toward a rod uh, on, you know, on something. And so, you know, we want to versus some of these lesser non impactful documents like the EA, the categorical right. exclusion of the Fonzie. And so yeah, yeah. I, 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 right. I just want to, I want to get the universe right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, and so yeah, maybe that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, let, let me be clear. I'm really speaking about the delegation of authority related to the approval of the local right. board document. I'm not talking about the CEs and the Fonzies and you know, okay, uh, and what, whatever you know, whatever the first two items are. Uh, th this this item, I mean, you know, going back to clarify here, this board is the responsible agency, and yes, it can be delegated to the CEO, but I I still uh, I'm still really searching for the words here to to lay it lay it clearly that there is a transparency issue. The reason the board meets in public is to discuss the issues in public. It's not really to uh, approve these behind the scenes and call it good. Uh, so if if we're not really being utilized to discuss these issues, then there's no point of even talking about <laughs> having a meeting. We can delegate everything. Yeah, I so, guess we need to be clear with the board. Um, and maybe this is just the distinction is that you've got a lead agency who is has CEQA responsibility and ultimately, you know, rod certification. And we are we are sitting in the FRA's role to make sure they follow the federal steps. And so our determination is follow the federal steps. Um, and so, uh, Serge? Well, uh, I, I'm, I may have a proposal um, that's occurred to me and we, we had intended informational items, but I concur and totally support the element of transparency and openness regarding providing the public an opportunity to comment. Um, you know, we can implement a process by which um, um, uh, our staff, myself, uh, Metro staff, uh, come to present to the board what the project is. Uh, and then we can make our the document, the LA Metro document, available on our website um, with the links that are you know appropriate to uh, facilitate the public's engagement and comment on it. And we can provide quite a bit of transparency in that element by hosting a board meeting, presenting to um, our board members what the project is, and providing access and information to the project and an opportunity to comment um, that. Uh, our staff, my staff, who you know implement this program, would ensure its integration into the environmental document and its full consideration to ensure um, that uh, you know the highest standards have been achieved, uh, and with your your intentions and objectives regarding transparency and communication. I like that. So, is that going to be incorporated into item three on page five of the resolution? Um, I, I think it can be. Uh, it, I don't know if it, it changes the delegation of authority regarding the CEO's ability to sign it. It's um, um, more of a policy and procedure regarding how we make available documents that are under our purview for review. But uh, I would look to Alicia. Th this is my first rodeo with the board, so forgive me for my <laughs> naivete when it comes to some of these elements. But, no, but I, I think but, what you can do is... Uh, I'm on page. I think you just add something to the end of, of H3. Right. I would. I. I would frankly put it in the beginning. Uh, and for the information of the board members, I'm at the. I'm on board policy HSRA 11001. 
as amended. It has, it's, I'm on page five. Mm -hmm. Item, item uh, three, all uh, underlined in blue. Um, like I said, Brian, I have no problem with the first two issues in terms of alignment with NEPA and also giving you authority to do the, the frankly, inconsequential environmental documents. I have no problem with that. The third one, you know, um, that's what we're talking about right now. And obviously, you know, um, I really appreciate the comments of the board members. So my question to Serge and to Alicia and to Brian, but as well as to Andre, what kind of language can we develop that we can include in item number three? And I would say include, you know, before the, the CEO approves the locally preferred alternative, he must do this, this, that, or this. You know, and I don't know whether we can figure that out right now. So I, I would suggest that maybe, you know, we 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 suspend this item and wait till we get, get that language back. You know, or we could vote for the first two items, uh, uh, giving Brian that type of authority while we work out this item number three. Let, let me ask let, let me uh, let me suggest something. We over, we've had uh, this sort of thing happen in, in previous uh, hearings, uh, not recently. Um, are we? Do you think, uh, Director Scusia? Do you think that um, with regards to this, um, usually what would happen would be our, our chief counsel would would uh, listen to what what has been suggested and then would just draft something. If we're not, and it doesn't seem to me that we're talking about um drafting a lot but can we get can we get to the the the, the specific um language that you would and let's just say that you could just suggest and let alicia go off offline so to speak a draft it and we can go forward and then we can come back and finish this item uh, or attempt to finish this item after we've gone through the other information items and are and come back to this and see if uh, the language that she has uh, suggesting is satisfactory to the board and can you do that without people feeling as though you're being jammed into a corner to have to make that decision well i mean alicia's a very confident and very you know um, well-qualified attorney i mean listen brian knows we have lawyers in the state legislature who literally, as they're speaking, they're drafting the amendment language. So we that can be done. You know, that can be done. So if what you're suggesting, Mr. Chairman, is to let Alicia to maybe go out with Serge and start discussing some language here to basically incorporate into item three, yeah. I would feel more comfortable with that language included in item three and vote for it. I'm not going to vote for something like, oh, let's yeah. think about this in concept. Yeah. I want to see the language in the resolution. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, unless unless the CEO needs this authority immediately in number one and two, I'd be comfortable seconding the, the motion to table until the next meeting so that staff can can put that language together. Because you know, going away in the next 20, 30 minutes and rushing, we may miss something. Mm, okay. So I, I would I, I would be more comfortable doing that. I, I would support that as well, just also to give the public some transparency and ability to digest it. Yeah. Oh, so that's a motion in a second. Yep. Has priority, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, we do have that. And we'll call the question. <laughs> call the we question. Have, we have a motion in a second. We, we have, uh, first of all, before we say, we know what's supposed to happen then with, uh, with staff uh, and management in the interim and then bring this back, but we have a motion in a second to table this uh, until uh, the next meeting. Wait, wait, no, no. I thought the motion was to give approval to the first two yeah, items. Yeah, okay, give approval to items one and two, and table, to table the third item number one. three to be brought back at the next, thank you, to be brought back at the next board meeting with the appropriate uh, modification to it uh, for, for consideration to the board. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Thanks, well, all, all right, we have that motion. Wait, 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 Tom, on that, may I have a yes. moment? Sure. Yes. Uh, Alicia, do, do you feel comfortable that you know what to glean from the all these various conversations, the balance between transparency and alacrity here? Absolutely. Um, so, okay. All right. Just want to make sure you have. Helpful. Okay. And okay. being mindful of the fast act so that we're not slowing anything down. Yeah. Well, that's what I said. Alacrity, Correct. transparency. Yeah. It's a balance. Okay. 
going to be a thank beautiful you, added thank you, thank you colleague we've colleagues we've got a motion in a second uh, please call the roll director shank yes did you hear me i said yes oh, yes i did uh chair richards okay. yes Direct Macho? Yes. Vice Chair Miller? Yes. Director Preya? Yes. Director Gilmetti? Yes. Director Escutia? Aye. Director Butros? Yes. Director Williams? Aye. <laughs> motion carries it is tabled okay well we've we've uh yeah we've at, we've acted on the first two items and we are tabling three okay thank you and then alicia it's on you so yeah. we'll, we'll see you next month um thank you colleagues moving on to item four is the is an informational report from uh, uh miss cedaroff regarding earth day and sustainability update Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vice Chair Richards. I'm sorry, thank you, Chair Richards and Vice Chair Miller. And I appreciate the opportunity to offer some updated material in honor of Earth Day, as well as some specifics on our implementation strategies for two of the authority's signature commitments. Next slide. And the next slide. So you're all very familiar with our policy which is to deliver this transformative project in a way that conveys benefits now to Californians and demonstrates that delivery of infrastructure can and should serve as a model in achieving social, economic, and environmental goals. In fact, the recent recognition from the Institute of Sustainable Infrastructure, which awarded the program Envision Platinum, its highest level of achievement, indicates that we are on a good track. Next slide. The program's sustainability framework is comprehensive across planning through operation and addresses sustainability aspects that are relevant to a rail mega project. Next slide. Today, I am concentrating on progress within a subset of that framework, specifically on our zero net commitments, both later this decade in operation and right now in construction. Audacious goals are a hallmark of California, and the state has spent the past 15 years or more establishing the policy and regulatory framework around renewable energy and the, carbonation, the decarbonization of transportation that provides an exceptionally robust platform for the practical implementation strategies that I'm focused on today. Next slide. In 2008, the board had the foresight to commit to a truly carbon-free high-speed rail travel experience. 100% clean, renewable energy for operation has been a very clear goal toward which to work. And the team's efforts have been on unpacking the details, including regulatory and statutory hurdles of cost-effective approaches. The end goal is an optimal strategy for the authority to implement in time for train testing. There are a few ways to approach operating entirely on renewable energy. While the team has explored standard agreements as well as means to access the wholesale market, over the past year, they've put considerable research into a behind the meter strategy enabled by recent CPUC net energy metering policy, uh, specifically at NEM 2.0. This strategy involves producing solar, ideally on well-configured parcels that the authority already owns, tied to a battery connected to the transmission interconnection point at our traction power substation locations. These behind the meter resources allow the authority to source renewable power on day one of train service and offer operational cost savings to the authority by reducing peak demand. This strategy also provides resilience benefits. The decision to cut power last summer on very short notice due to wildfires illustrates a harsh reality of the changing climate, and it's one for which the authority is planning logically. Over the rest of this year, a multidisciplinary team will continue financial and technical analyses to determine an optimal strategy for the authority. Next slide. Zero net construction emissions reflects an equation, and it's one for which we cu currently have a good balance sheet as these next 
view slides will illustrate. As you know, we've planted more than 6,000 trees through our agreement with CAL FIRE, which funded two grantees, Tree Fresno, who uh, actually may have kicked us well over 6,000 trees, um, and the California Urban Forest Council, who have fanned out to disadvantaged communities across the state for large and small tree planting projects, as well as rural reforestation and care. From a global standpoint, these projects deliver a balance of 180,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, while to date, we've only produced 40,000. But for communities, right now, these trees are delivering shaded recreational and public spaces and cleaner air. Next slide. To minimize criteria air pollution, the authority already requires tier four vehicles where available for off-road equipment. This means significant positive benefit for our construction sites, the local communities and air basins. Fewer tons of nitrogen oxide and reactive organic gases and particulate matter mean a much cleaner air for site workers and the surrounding communities. Of course, monitoring by field staff is crucial for consistent compliance, which is an issue paramount to communities in which we are constructing. Next slide. Now to offset those pollutants in 2014, we signed a voluntary emissions reduction agreement with the San Joaquin Air Pollution Control District. They are a very well organized partner with a highly efficient process and have completed projects that realize over 1300 tons of pollution offsets. They provide us with proof that older tractors and truck engines and at least one school bus have been crushed and recycled and replaced by new model vehicles with modern filtration technology. Next slide. Additionally, the accomplishment of mitigation commitments for habitat and agriculture are providing additive benefit relative to greenhouse gas emissions and pollution. The authority has already secured landscape scale and other parcels to provide conservation easements at multiple locations. That's more than 3,600 acres permanently protected, providing an array of vital habitat, including grasslands, wetlands, and vernal pool landscapes for a range of species. And through the Department of Conservation, we've secured more than 1,200 acres of permanent agricultural easements. These activities honor our mitigation commitments, but they also sit in the context of broader state goals to conserve 30% of land and coastal water by 2030 and to reduce vehicle miles traveled. Next slide. So now I'd like to frame up our plan to further minimize construction emissions. We are at an inflection point in the transition towards zero emission vehicles, or ZEVs. The governor, of course, sent a clear signal in his executive order in September of last year, setting ambitious statewide targets to transition the transportation sector to zero emissions. And more recently, the American Jobs Plan proposed $174 billion for ZEV infrastructure. These actions magnify the consistent focus for the past two decades of state policy to transition toward renewable energy and away from fossil fuel dependent fleets. That framework of public policy and regulation has pushed and incentivized industry to deliver to the California market the type of advanced innovative products that our project is ideally situated to take advantage of. Next slide. As we look to the future and the advance and the increase of construction of the system throughout the state, we see ZEVs as a very useful tool for minimizing emissions in construction. But we are pragmatic about how challenging the powerful and ubiquitous diesel engine is to change. As such, our implementation strategy is tailored to different classes of vehicles. Next slide. Given the products currently in production and scheduled for release, there is a clear place to start for future construction contracts. 100% ZEVs for contractor site fleet travel. These are vehicles that construction supervisors and field workers use to travel the very long linear site every day. And this move eliminates the direct carbon emissions from these vehicles, which have in certain years constituted half or more of the total construction carbon footprint and reduces the amount of offsets that the authority separately pays for. We've also established milestones for zero emissions on-road hauling vehicles and off-road equipment with the intention of signaling the importance of zero emissions vehicles to our construction. 
these classes of vehicles provide greater implementation challenges or don't have the same range of products on offer in the near term, which makes it difficult to speak in absolute terms, which is why we are more measured in our approach and are following the lead of the executive order. But first, we will prioritize suppliers and subs that have on-road hauling fleets with ZEVs and look to contract incentives for compliance. Then by 2035, we'll require all short haul and drayage fleets to be fully ZEV, and by 2045, fully transition to zero emissions, heavy duty trucks where it's feasible. For off-road equipment, we will first identify opportunities and pilot projects for electric off-road equipment. Then by 2030, we'll require 10% zero emissions off-road equipment, and by 2035, fully transition to zero emissions off-road equipment, again, where feasible. We will continuously revisit these implementation strategies, particularly in regions that may set more aggressive requirements and where the markets have been better established, as well as when new ZEV technologies for medium, heavy duty, and off-road equipment become commercially available. Next slide. Finally, uh, Earth Day is a robust reminder that this is the only planet that we live on. And that planet has been providing considerable feedback in our lifetime that global climate systems have been disrupted. To address our vulnerability to the local risks exacerbated by climate disruption, the authority has worked collaboratively across functional and technical areas to complete a climate adaptation plan. This plan memorializes the design and other techniques in place that provide adaptive capacity for the system. The executive, the executive summary should be available uh, next month. Next slide. As an investment of 25% of cap and trade proceeds, we understand that our mission to deliver a transformative electric high-speed rail system must also, right now, and as we continue to build out into the Silicon Valley and the, and the LA Basin, deliver recovery and benefit to communities who are burdened by unemployment and environmental harm. The vision for this project established by the voters is sustainable development for current and future Californians through travel times that connect the disparate and geographically separate economies of the state. Crucially, as we move toward that vision, the project is already providing a living wage to thousands of women and men. So this presentation provides a window into ongoing staff work to fulfill the goals and commitments of the project. I want to thank you for your time this morning reviewing how by logically tying our implementation strategies to broader California policy and pointing to clear goals, we avail the program of the infinite creativity that the market is bringing to zero emissions technology. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Cedaroff. Any questions for uh, Margaret? You must have a great, job. great job in what she's doing. Yeah. We appreciate your enthusiasm with the way you uh, look at your job and the way you discharge uh, your responsibilities, Margaret. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Great. All right. Uh, we'll move on to item number five, which is also information, and that's uh, the CEO report. Uh, Brian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, sorry to follow that presentation. <laughs> It's a tough one, Brian. Meg is so good. Um, I, I am happy to just uh, update the members on a couple of things. I think uh, before I get into the uh, before I get into the PowerPoint presentation, which will come next, uh, just as a matter of updating on a couple of things. Um, first, I want to inform the board that uh, mostly at the suggestion of uh, Director Shank, but also in working with uh, Chair Richards, uh, I want to make sure the board members know that we have. The, the board and the authorities now join the National Association of Corporate Directors, or NACD. Uh, this is an association and organization that's uh, committed to elevating board uh, performance and interactions by providing ongoing educational resources and opportunities on best practices in both corporate and public sector governance for board directors, as well as key executives who uh, staff the board. Um, the NACD is an association that uh, both serves corporate directors uh, in the private sector, but also on the public sector side, including here in California, the CalPERS board uh, and many local boards like the San Diego uh, County Retirement Association 
and to various port authorities around the country. Uh, NAC, NACD provides a wide range of useful resources and events uh, for more than uh, 21,000 directors nationwide, more than 1,600 organizations. You may have already received an email from Peter Gleason, who is the NACD online uh, facilitator um, that will provide you with some login credentials to start accessing some of their digital resources. In addition, NACD has assigned us with our own board advisor, who is Mercedes Adobe, who will act as a liaison to all of the NACD resources to help us get the most uh, of our membership with the association. I'll say that I've gone online and I've seen uh, some of the things that they offer. I've also been in touch with some of the leadership at CalPERS about their interactions with NACD. I think you will find access to things like guides and tools and analysis to help uh, the board use common governance language and pursue uh, virtual learning courses on everything from risk oversight, uh, compliance and ethics, board and management interaction, and financial oversight, among other topics, including, uh, again, interactions between uh, board and management. All nine voting members of the board now have access to the NACD uh, information online. And I imagine that very soon I'll be introducing the advisor from NACD to this board uh, once we are fully onboarded. So I, I wanted, this came to me through uh, Director Shank. I, I did some, had my staff and myself do some homework on this association and the work they do with other public center, sector agencies um, and thought it made sense for us to avail ourselves of, of this, um, uh, of the, these resources. I talked to Chairman Richards about it. And so I wanted to make you aware of all this and that this is uh, occurring. And I guess before I do anything else, uh, Director Shank, who has the most experience here, I just want to open and allow you to make any comments about this that, that you may want to. Thanks, Brian. Yes, uh, the, the, the notion of boards that uh, sort of change on a regular basis like ours uh, has and will continue uh, the interaction between boards and management, the interactions with uh, CEO and management, uh, you know, th this is not something that we're sort of born instinctively knowing how to do. And those of us who have uh, been in the public sector uh, for a good part of career uh, may not have a lot of experience in the private sector, vice versa. Uh, a lot has transpired in the private sector uh, with public company boards that are valuable models for boards such as ours and other other public boards, uh, I have found over the years NACD to be really, really valuable. And so I would commend everyone to look at what they have to offer, uh, take advantage of it. They used to have in-person meetings and conferences uh, that also uh, just are very, very valuable to our own uh, learning our own uh, development as board members, but now everything is online and it's still, as I say, something that is worth your attention and your time. And uh, I, I'm glad that they assigned someone to us to help guide us through the vast number of uh, opportunities that there is to, to learn from others, to learn best practices and models that have been successful for others. So uh, Brian, thank you very much for following up, for researching, for uh, talking to them and seeing that this in fact is of value to uh, our authority and management. Sure, and I, I will say that um, there will be more to come on this, as I said, uh, probably including the introduction of the advisor to the board and uh, more materials on, on exactly uh, how we we'll move forward on this, but I, I wanted to inform you that we are moving down this road and, and make sure that you all are aware of this. Well, I, I, would like, oh, I would like to thank Lynn as well as Chairman Richards and Brian for actually doing this. I got the email invitation to form my own account, which I right away did. And boy, the first page I did, Lynn, you know that I've always been wanting to get this kind of training, you know? And the first page that came out in the pop-up was diversity, inclusion, and equity. Oh, they had me on that. <laughs> they had yeah. me on that. And, you know, and I just really hope that, you know, for us, it's going to be a learning experience because we are lifelong learners. 
and um, and learn from these as to how best we can adopt, you know, even more best practices into our own agency, not only amongst ourselves as board members, but also as to as to the staff and, and developing good work environments. You know, so I, I, I'm just very impressed and I'm just very grateful. So I'm going to sign up for some of those classes. Good. Yeah, I would just say that uh, uh, there is now such a, a, a gray area between, you know, public companies, private companies. And, and when I say public, I mean shareholder in the private sector and our own kinds of public boards in terms of the challenges and the issues uh, that confront us every day. So why not learn from others? So, yeah, great. Okay, uh, the second item, uh, I'm gonna do this uh, pretty briefly. It's a kind of a high level presentation. I'll ask for the PowerPoint to come up now. I wanted to give a high level uh, sort of presentation on uh, where we are. If we can go back one slide on that. Um, on the, uh, th this is just a high level review of what we know to date on the Federal American Jobs Plan, which is uh, the $2.3 trillion program that was put forward by President Biden. There's a lot of work. Uh, that will go uh, into this over the next course of the next uh, couple of uh, months, obviously, and even beyond. Um, I will say to the board that uh, I had some interactions with the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee uh, the other day, and they are beginning to move into what they call the mock-up mode of the of the uh, uh, the initial reauthorization bill, which is will likely be a five-year or so horizon bill for transportation investments. Uh, in totality, uh, this uh, program is, again, the entirety of the American jobs package is something like we haven't seen uh, in really decades. It's a $2.3 trillion program that covers uh, infrastructure from uh, transportation to water to broadband to uh, power to all kinds of elements and I'm going to focus on some of the transportation elements here just to give you a flavor of where we think we have we are relevant in this and where we will play and continue to work with Congress on some of these so uh, next slide let me just uh, jump into this on the transportation side the Biden administration's uh, program includes an 80 billion dollar passenger rail program uh, 20 billion of that is specified for inner city rail and a 25 billion dollar what they're calling a transformational infrastructure projects fund that still needs to be a bit defined in the uh, rules and regulations about eligibility and those things are still to come, but these are some of the highlight uh, uh, elements that are in this uh, program. The proposed fiscal year 2022 budget includes 625 million for a new uh, yet unnamed co competitive grant program for passenger rail and uh, the funding proposed for local and commuter transit also uh, quadruples where it was in the past and uh, could benefit high-speed rail construction on those shared corridors where project sponsors are doing capital improvements that also uh, uh, help us. Just by way of background, Congress last year passed HR2 that proposed a significant boost in transportation funding as part of the Transportation Reauthorization Act. Among those funding programs was a $19 billion program for what they call Passenger Rail Improvement, Modernization and Expansion, or PRIME. Uh, which is a grant that we would likely be able to directly apply for grants in for high-speed rail and other transformative rail investments. And uh, they it also increased funding uh, proposed for local and commuter transit that, again, could benefit our program where we are operating in shared uh, corridors. Uh, next slide. The totality of this program, as I said, $2.3 trillion across the board for various uh, elements of, um, uh, of infrastructure about 571 billion of that is transportation specific. And as you come down even a little bit further, 80 billion of that uh, is for passenger rail specifically. But what this chart shows and what I wanted to convey to the board is even outside of the $80 billion passenger rail pot, there are several grant pots that are a part of this program whose size have you know quadrupled uh, above what has been the historical baseline amount that's been in these programs. This is a massive investment of eight year duration uh, in various pots. And this is designed to just uh, show the board where there are various pots that we have played in and, and, and intend to play in going forward uh, relative to uh, investments here. One is the, the first one's of course, the National Intercity uh, Passenger 
rail program, which would have direct dollars available for high-speed rail programs. The eight-year duration is about $20.8 billion of that. Then there's a series of other transportation-related programs and grants that are outside of the $80 billion pot, but are also uh, important elements that, uh, again, we have in the past and we think going forward, we would continue to be grant recipients or grant app appliers in for sure. And that would include this new transformative infrastructure projects pot with broad eligibility for different types of infrastructure. That'll be a competitive grant program. Uh, the details and eligibility of that is still to be flushed out, but that's a eight year, $25 billion program. And then things like what's used to be called build grants, uh, including uh, investments in road, rail, and transit projects that promise to achieve various national objectives. That's also a competitive grant program. Uh, we have applied for those in the past. We are looking at applying for one now, uh, with or without this program. We have an infra grant today that is pending uh, approval with the USDOT that we are currently uh, in application for relative to the WASCO matter that we've discussed. Uh, and so we play in that. Uh, Chrissy grants, we have been supporters of applicants for Chrissy grants for things like uh, grade separations uh, on elements that affect our program, uh, both uh, in and around Bakersfield and the Palmdale area. And these are areas under the program that, again, are just getting such a huge uh, influx of investment uh, should the American Jobs Plan be approved that we are uh, inc both encouraged and optimistic about our ability to, to do well. Uh, under the program. And then there's some new things that really need to be fleshed out, like the infrastructure grand uh, challenge, infrastructure grand challenge uh, program, which has got, again, right now, broad eligibility for various infrastructure projects. But as you can see in totality here, there's some 58 to $70 billion in various transportation uh, investment grants that, again, we think we have been eligible for in the past, and we think we will be eligible for going forward. So this is again a high level chart. There's a lot of work uh, going uh, that will be occurring underway as, for example, Congress starts to mock up the statute, the legislation to move forward on the reauthorization. I believe the timing of them doing that gets us into late May. Uh, but uh, as, as that work is going forward, um, again, we look at this and, and we're encouraged and optimistic that there's uh, a lot of uh, you know, room to, to, to play uh, for this program. And so I wanted to convey that uh, to the board here. Brian, is this yeah. just to say uh, the, the pot of dollars available um, for the state or for countrywide? Uh, the dollar signs on this are na nationwide. This is a federal, federal program. Uh, and so, but again, these are pots that if you just add this up, it's on the order of, you know, 72, 73 billion here on the national scale. And again, these are just uh, various programs where we've played in the past and where we or we have a, a, a grant uh, pending and we would expect to to play going forward. So, again, and, and some new pots that we need to still see how those are developed, like the transformative uh, pr uh, infrastructure pot. The other thing on the as I move past sort of the broad scale of this, uh, there are a couple of other things that are pending in Congress. I just want the board to be aware of move to the next slide. There's been legislation introduced both by, a con uh, sorry, uh, yes, Congressman uh, Jim Costa that uh, establishes and implements the high-speed rail corridor program. Uh, that is an $8 billion uh, program per year uh, over a four-year cycle totaling $32 billion. It's really dedicated to electrified higher-speed uh, rail programs. And then really the most, uh, the, the biggest or most, uh, I guess I'd say ambitious program has been introduced by Congressman Seth Moulton from Massachusetts, which is a $41 billion annual five-year high-speed rail or higher-speed rail corridor planning development and capital uh, construction program uh, that has also been introduced this, this cycle. So these are just things that are pending at the federal level. We will be, I, I will utilize our legislative lead, Jane Brown, to update the board periodically as we go forward. And as Congress is taking steps going forward on how these are taking form and shape. Uh, but I wanted you to be aware that uh, they're in the game. Yeah, Brian, uh, Brian, is Costa's bill also, it, it's for several several quarters or? Um, well, yeah. It's I, a, Bolton's bill, I wasn't aware of Costa's. Yes, uh, Costa's bill is, a, is uh, a dedicated program, 32 billion over four years. 
that is dedicated to electrified high-speed rail corridors. Okay. And so, uh, but they all are in national and national scope. Yeah. Um, okay. Then, I think my bill set the quarters. I'm just wondering if this is. Uh, well, I'll check with with Jim on it. Thank you. Oh, uh, Brian, on the question of, of the city of Wasco, and I know how controversial you know that issue was involving farm worker housing. Yep. You mentioned that they're going to be. I, I have they already applied for this grant? We applied. And, we oh, applied for the grant. You applied on behalf of them. Yes. And right. so that that grant application went in, I want to say at the end of March. And the award, uh, I believe the award date when we will know is uh, next week, April 26th. Oh God, thank you. I mean, that's that is great. I'm glad that that we're hopefully going to be able to solve that problem. I then my so. other little pet project, as you well know, is the little community of Fairmead. Yes. Their environmental problems. Yes. Is there some kind of avenues here with all this federal money for Fairmead to perhaps get some money to finally get some water and sewage hookups? Yes. Well, as you know, we have um, we've been in negotiations for some time now, both with the surrounding counties. Um, and Madera County uh, by name uh, and the Friends of Fairmead. I'm, I wanna come back when things are actually signed, but I wanna say that um, uh, our lead down in the region, Garth Fernandez has done a, a terrific job along with our council, Lisa Crowfoot, who has uh, continued to work diligently with the counties. And I believe we have generally an agreement and concept on how we will move forward on all of those issues relative to the mitigation of project impacts affecting both the water and sewage uh, issues there, as well as the construction of the community center uh, in Fairmead. So I am i don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I want to say that I think the work and the time and the diligence that's been involved uh, in that effort is uh, close to bearing fruit. And, um, and I, I'm hopeful I can report to the board uh, uh, very soon, like maybe as soon as next, next briefing about um, uh, just how locked up that is, but I, I we've, we've we've made some great gains there. Thank you. Uh, next slide on this, please. Again, um, we've already talked about this, but there's been uh, comments both from President Biden, um, U.S. DOT Secretary Buttigieg, and of course the acting uh, FRA Administrator Amy Bose, all continuing expressions of support for investment in high-speed rail nationwide. And, uh, and of course, uh, we're in uh, close communications with the FRA on some investments that have uh, already come to this program that we are working uh, through settlement to uh, maintain. Uh, but again, I just wanna say that as we uh, get through this and as the American Jobs Plan comes out, it's very clear from the administration that high-speed rail is a clear objective of uh, something that they wanna advance and uh, use this investment to move forward. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, we'll talk uh, more about this uh, later, but uh, just re reminding members, we have a FY10 grant that uh, the Trump administration uh, proposed to de-obligate $929 million. We filed suit uh, against that. Um, and in March of this year, just last month, uh, we worked closely with the FRA and the Department of Justice to stay uh, that matter in the federal court so we can enter settlement discussions, and we are in active settlement negotiations on that now. So I just wanted to update board members on that. And then uh, relative to our ARA grant, which is the 2.5 billion we've already spent of federal funds, we are required to match that dollar for dollar. And uh, again, after some time of not much process going on at the federal level during the prior administration, I'm uh, happy to uh, reflect with the members now where we are with the Biden administration on that. If I can move to the Next slide. Uh, of the 2.5 billion that we are uh, obligated to match, uh, just this week, the Biden administration, the FRA, approved another 577 million of our match. So we have sent back now all 2.5 billion in match funds. They are processing those invoices that we have sent back. And as of today, they've approved just under 2.2 billion. So 87% of the match is approved by the FRA and we're uh, work to get that final 13% approved uh, in relative short order. So again, I wanted to take a moment to reflect where we are with all the movements going on at the federal level, get a sense of what's happening there 
uh, with us vis-a-vis uh, -vis our federal partners and, uh, and uh, reflect uh, that to the board members uh, here. And so that's, that's my update on the uh, federal statute. I'm happy to answer any questions on that before I move on uh, to other items. No. Okay. Um, the other, uh, let's see, I did update this already, and that's just that uh, we got the match uh, dollars up. Uh, the last thing I, I want to just uh, uh, mention to the board as a update is that uh, I believe by the end of this month, we are on pace to get the uh, all the construction packages in the Central Valley, CPs 1, 2, 3, and 4 under uh, full 100% design. Uh, that means all the scope would be uh, now within the the document. So I say that because it's now a very good time to come back to the board and do a, a very a thorough uh, sort of construction update uh, to the board on each of the construction packages, uh, where we've been, where we are, and the steps that we need to uh, uh, make going forward to, to advance that work and get that work done. And so I just say that as sort of a look ahead to the May board meeting, in addition to coming back with the delegation of authority question that we left open uh, earlier today. I also want to flag for the board that there will be a comprehensive presentation to the board on the status of construction of the, the CPs in the in the Central Valley. And again, I think the occasion for this is tied to the fact that we've now reached a really 100% design of each of the packages. We have the full scope in in uh, insights and we now have a better, much better understanding of what it is we've got to roll through to get the work done. And so I'm Looking forward to coming back to the board uh, and have that conversation at the the May the May hearing. And so, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, that is my uh, oh, that's my CEO update. But I have one more thing that is um, I'm actually sorry to report to the board, but I I I am obligated to report to the board, and that is um, I did become aware uh, at the beginning of last week that uh, one of our peer review group. Uh, board members, Marty Walks, who is uh, Professor Martin Walks, who is somebody that I've worked with over the entirety of my professional career, uh, passed away. And um, uh, Mr. Chairman, so right with you, I'd like to request that we adjourn uh, today's uh, hearing in his memory. Uh, Marty Walks was a just a phenomenal professional in transportation who had expertise on uh, planning and growth issues, on uh, 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 investments in transportation that um, uh, that uh, uh, get what you're looking for in terms of the best bang in, from the buck, uh, and that um, uh, I again I spoke with him well before I was here, and he was on the PRG as he was a professor at, uh, in the UC system. Uh, worked with him often on uh, various transportation matters over the years, and I just want to express uh, my own personal. Uh, condolences to his family, to the other members of the PRG board, and, and just say to you all, it's a great loss because not only did I find Professor Wax to be a, a, just a, a really outstanding expert in his field, but more than that, a very gentle soul and a very, uh, very easy person to work with and engage with. And so it was a hard loss for the PRG, a hard loss for anybody who had the pleasure of knowing and working with uh, Professor Walks, and again, respectfully, Mr. Chair, I request that we can adjourn today's meeting in, in his memory. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and uh, we will do that. Any questions for Brian? Okay, we'll move on uh, quickly to uh, a short overview of the Finance and Audit Committee meeting earlier this morning. Um, and touch base on it on a few items that were, were discussed. As you probably recall, uh, the February audit for cap and trade um, came in at, at almost uh, 162 million for the authority. Uh, if you annualize that, if the other next three are similar, that would take us up to around 650 million over a four, four quarter period. Uh, as you know, our expectation and planning and budgeting is uh, 500 a year. Uh, so hopefully the trend that we've seen in uh, in the auction, the cap and trade auctions will continue after uh, really falling apart uh, earlier last year with uh, with the COVID-19 
pandemic. The vacancy, uh, employee vacancy uh, dropped uh, about 2.2% down to 27%, uh, reducing vacancy by eight uh, down to 96. And uh, you may also recall that the vacancy went so high because of the allocation of additional 40, or excuse me, 85 employees for the authority. Our budget for the 2021 fiscal year was, uh, or is 2.9 billion. Uh, forecast where we think we'll be at the end of the fiscal year be about 1.8. Uh, of that uh, 1.6 uh, includes construction and related uh, in initiatives. We've completed about 45% of that uh, in uh, two thirds of the fiscal year. Total project expenditures uh, to date are about 8.1 billion. That's 75% of which is construction related, 16% project design, our development, and about 2%, which is our limitation for, ad, for administration. Um, the total uh, value of existing contracts uh, are, is roughly 8.4 billion. Um, the small business utilization rate has been, as I pointed out before, reasonably flat over the last year. Uh, we were about five tenths of a percentage point higher a year ago uh, than we are today. We're currently at 21.3%. Uh, we have um, 609 small businesses uh, associated with the authority at this point, 92 of which are disabled uh, business entities and 67 are disabled veteran business entities. Our contingent summary, contingency summary uh, with the Rev-1 budget, which we currently operate under, um, is uh, 1.585 uh, billion, of which um, 731 is project uh, related, a uh, construction project related. There are, are several categories, one of which is other, and we talked about what uh, contingency is an other. Um, the majority of that, the contingency in the 280 uh, million is track and systems, which is 216, uh, environmental and project development, which is 47, and um, uh, a funding amount of 34 million for the RDP uh, to fund through uh, October or November of this year. Uh, that will be coming. Uh, it's not been applied to the RDP at this point, but will be in the next couple of months or so. With regards to the Central Valley uh, status update, the uh, dollars necessary to complete the R requirement, construction of about five point, uh, just about five billion uh, exactly. Uh, we've spent to date about three point two billion. Uh, that's about 30, or excuse me, 63%. The construction progress in the month of February was uh, substantially below uh, budget, RB below a forecast. Uh, the major reasons included uh, weather, uh, utility relocations, delays in right of way acquisition, and uh, uh, getting third party design uh, approved. We expect uh, that to increase uh, in the month of uh, April, uh, excuse me, in the month of uh, March, which will be reported uh, next month. Uh, as you know, these reporting uh, uh, dates that we come to you, they're two months behind where we are today. Um, we were 30.5 million in February. Uh, we expect 48 in March and the expectations for this summer will be uh, somewhere between 80 and 90 million, uh, according to our COO. Contract contingency uh, at the outset was 2.6, almost 2.66 billion. We have remaining um, uh, 731 million and we project by six of 21, it'll be about 436 million. In April, uh, daily workers, uh, just most recently in the last couple of three days, uh, we were 
uh, up to about 1,100 a day. Back in uh, in February, we're at 997. We continue uh, we continue to expect those numbers to increase. Um, in terms of uh, construction in C in the CPs one through four, we have 80 miles of guideway uh, under construction or completed. There were no increases in my mi in mileage uh, in February. In structures, we had need a total of 93. Uh, 59 are under construction or completed. That was a, a increase of one uh, over the uh, previous reporting for January. Just to give you a sense of the scope of utility relocations, for the 119 miles included, uh, uh, which were under which are under construction, there are 2,065 utility relocations necessary. Of that number, 575 are currently completed, 505 are in process, 128 are scheduled, and 857 have not started. On the small business uh, in, uh, utilization, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have um, currently 464 uh, small businesses involved in and around construction in the CPs in the Central Valley. Uh, the the uh, contract uh, value is about $1 billion and the expectation is about $1.5 billion will have been uh, earned by small businesses upon the completion of the 119 miles of construction. Uh, you know, may know that uh, right of way, you certainly all know right of way has been an issue uh, for as long as we have been under construction. We have a requirement for 2,285 2, parcels, 1,792 have been delivered to date. In February, there were 16 deliveries, 17 expected in March and 20 in April. And that pretty much uh, is a brief summary of what occurred, what was uh, passed to uh, or discussed with uh, the committee this morning. Uh, are there any questions on on the uh, finance and audit uh, report? All right, seeing none. Thank you very much, um, colleagues and uh, ladies and gentlemen who are with us, uh, either listening or watching. Uh, that concludes the agenda items for today's meeting. However, uh, we have a one clo a closed session, which we will now move to. So we are going to go to closed session and I will reconvene uh, after the closed session with you who are with us in the public to report anything that the board may uh, have uh, conducted uh, in closed session if uh, if there's anything to be reported. So with that, uh, for those of you who will not be with us uh, at the conclusion of the closed session, thank you for being with us. For those who will be with us, I suspect that this may take about uh, one hour. And uh, so I, again, will be with you after one hour. So thank you again for joining us and colleagues, I'll see you momentarily. On Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is uh, Tom Richards, the closed session for the California High Speed Rail Authority Board of Directors is concluded um, and uh, the board has nothing to report to the public. So thank you for, very much for being with us today and we'll look uh, forward to your participation at our next meeting in May. For, uh, for today, thank you and uh, be safe and the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>